Man, it's good to be back with you. I missed you so much last week, and it hasn't gone unnoticed that you chose to eat here last week while I was away. But certainly, I really appreciate your prayers. Uh, my hip replacement surgery went as perfect as it could have gone. It was, it was amazing. Uh, and, and I give total, um, you know, it, it's only God that can, can do something like that. And I thank you for all your prayers. They've been absolutely awesome. The messages, the prayers, the visits was, are, are uh, you know, really all credit to God for answering your prayers. I thank you for that. As you can tell, the liposuction was a total failure. The, the, the facelift was, no, just, yeah, that wasn't a success either. So for me, it's back to Violet Cooney's wrinkle goes. But um, hey, <laughs> everything can't go well in um, this life. Anyway, we've spoken enough nonsense, so let's talk about the good stuff. Two weeks ago, and thank you, Philip, for, for standing in for me. You always do a great job, and I always, always, Philip's always willing, and I'm really, really grateful uh, for you. Two weeks ago, I brought you the first of a two part series called Soul Survivor. Because I said, as we have all noticed, our souls are in trouble. Many of us, we're a worn out and, and we're, we're just washed out, and we're living these lives as Henry David Thoreau says, in quiet desperation. In fact, his full quote is, most men live lives in quiet desperation. Josh, if you'll please bring up that um, picture of that duck. I don't know if how many have seen this, but uh, you know, the duck on the top, he looks fine. But underneath the surface, he's paddling like crazy. And I think that's what happens, you know. We look at everybody else. We come to church and look at everybody. Everybody's smiling and happy. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. But underneath, many of us are paddling in quiet desperation. I mean, so many. I mean, I, I, I was just trying to count and, and I, I've lost, and I, I know probably six or seven people in, in this church family suffering with cancer. Until people suffering relationship challenges, financial challenges. You're right, Henry David Thoreau. Most men are living lives in quiet desperation. So these two lessons are for those who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. As we saw two weeks ago, we have normalized doing life in a way that is toxic to our souls. And the consequences are, are huge. We have lost our connection with God. We, we have become, well, not because we have lost this connection, we, we've become poor ambassadors. Why would anyone want to have our lives? Why would non-Christians look at us as Christians and say, I want to have a life like that? When our lives are also full of anxiety and, and angst and depression and all these other things that go with it. Because as we noticed two weeks ago, that, that non-Christians do not read Bibles, they read Christians. And so when they look at your life, can you say, I am an imitator of God as one of his beloved children, as we are commanded to do in the scriptures? Remember Matthew chapter 11 that we, we looked at. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Jesus' promise, that incredible promise that we found in the very first book of the New Testament, Come to me, I will give you rest. My yoke, you're, you're going to wear a yoke. But I tell you what, my yoke is better to wear. We need rested souls. And that's why we're talking about uh, the, this Soul Survivor series. I don't know if you've seen this coffee mug uh, before. It says, I'm not an early bird or a night owl. I'm some form of permanently exhausted pigeon. And I think many people identify with that, isn't that right? It's just like, it's just always exhausted. I mean, if we're honest, folks, many of us are waking up in the morning and we're exhausted. We're exhausted. And so we have lost the image of Jesus Christ in our lives because we have been sucked into doing the world as the world does. It's toxic, but the devil has given us a lie. 
And when our souls are sick and fed up and tired, we cannot offer God our best, and we certainly cannot be ambassadors for Jesus Christ and his kingdom. So the, the question, of course, the rhetorical question, how can we give what we don't have? How can we give the abundant life when we don't have it ourselves? How can we help others up when we are down ourselves? How can we survive in a world that is inherently, inherently stressful? Let's just let's acknowledge it. Life is stressful. No one gets off scot free. No one gets to say, I went through life, no stress, you know, no pressure, no, no, no hassles, you know, no loss, no financial problems, no relationship hassles. We all have pressure. But I ask you this again. How come some people seem to just fly in that life when everything else is like the cesspool of a mess in this world but other people just seem to crater when you're in a world that is in a total mess and your soul is doing well you're living the life that God has called you to do when you're living in a life and you're able to withstand those outside pressures because your soul has been filled you've taken the Lord's yoke you know you're doing well. I think probably one of the most perfect examples of this is this man. Let's put his picture up there. Horatio Spafford. I've told you the story before. I will tell it again because it's the most incredible story. He was a strong believer. He and his wife had several children. They lived in Chicago. But they were about to enter into a world of hurt like you cannot even begin to imagine. Some of us have had a taste of it. At four years old, he had a son who died of scarlet fever. And as they were trying to get over that, the next year there was this fire in Chicago and his booming business basically went up in flames. And two years later, as he was still trying to get himself on his feet, his friend uh, Dale Moody was going on a on a mission trip, and he decided like going to, to going to England. And he said, "I've got to join him." So he sent his wife and his four daughters ahead. They bought a passage on a ship, and they were travelling on the ship. He was going to follow later, and another ship collided with their ship, and all four daughters were drowned. His wife was found unconscious on, on a plank in the ocean and she was rescued, eventually taken to shore and she sent him the old cable which read, Save Alone. Five children, all lost, and his business. Horatio Spasher booked a ticket on a boat to cross the sea and join his wife and be able to comfort them, comfort her. And when they um when they got to the place where the accident and the, and the shipwreck had happened and all his daughters died the captain called him and said mr spafford this is this is where it happened he came out he looked out over the sea and it's commonly believed that's when he went to his cabin and he penned those incredible words it is well with my soul how can you do that when you've experienced such horrendous things in, in, in your life, you can say, it is well with my soul. Why do we love the song so much? Why, why does the song resonate so deeply within us, in ourselves? I believe it is because, uh, you know, we want to believe that when we live this life and we will experience loss, there will be death, there, there will be disasters. There will, there will be things happening now. There will be looting and there will be floods and there will be accidents and there will be all these other things. That it can still be well with our souls. We do believe that Jesus meant it when he said, Come to me, you weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. It's possible to live life with a full soul according to the scriptures. 
And so I brought you the scripture two weeks ago as well, Third John chapter two, uh, Third John, um, and verse two. And, and I said, I wish I could pray this prayer over every one of you as John prayed it over his disciples. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. I, I, I hope everything in your life is doing as well as your soul. Could I pray that over you? How's your soul doing? How's your soul doing? <laughs> Don't mess with stuff. Don't pray that type of prayer over there because all of a sudden, you know, Everything else, my health and everything else might go as badly as my soul. But John knew his readers, irrespective of what was happening and all the persecution and the deaths and the imprisonments that was taking place in the first century, John could write, I know it's going well with your soul. You're losing family members. Man, the, the, uh, the horrendous um, pain and persecution being being uh, exercised by the Romans. But you know what? The persecution on the church doesn't matter your souls are doing well i'd love to pray that prayer over you so this morning in our in our lesson i want to give you just a few other pointers and hopefully they will be of benefit to you as we spoke last time and i wonder just to remind you folks these sermons mean absolutely nothing until they're actioned you might send me a whatsapp say there was a great sermon and uh, and I hope that you do find them beneficial. But until we, we choose, you want the life of Jesus, but you have to follow the lifestyle of Jesus. Until we decide to change our diet in terms of what we're taking in to our minds, in terms of what, to, what we're, our screen time and our lifestyle, nothing will change. And our, stole, our souls will still be in angst if we change nothing. So today I want to still give you a few more suggestions about being soulful. If you remembered a couple of weeks ago, if you haven't listened to that lesson, can I encourage you? I think there's some beneficial stuff. We spoke about being silent, the importance of silence. We spoke about the importance of sleep. How important it is. We noticed that before Edison invited the light bulb, the average person slept 11 hours a day. Many of us are hardly getting a few and we just, our lives are just, we're just walking zombies and we looked at the importance of Sabbath, that Jesus practiced a day of the week, put everything else aside, they got together with believers and there was worship. Go, go watch it. Number one today, fill your eyes and ears with beauty. Fill your eyes and your ears with beauty. Doesn't the scriptures tell us the heavens declare? the glory of God. A soul must be nourished in order to be healthy. And one of the ways God feeds our soul was, is with the wonder and the majesty of his creation. Some time back, I remember our family going away on holiday and uh, we all going lying on the grass outside. And of course, there's no light pollution where we went up and towards the berg there. No street lights and all the building lights. It's pitch black outside, lying on the grass and looking up. It's just incredible stars. Just, you know, look at the shooting stars and, and the satellites and all these things. And you have to acknowledge there's a God when you see that. No, something just go poof. Oh, everything's perfect up there. It didn't work that way. One of our problems is our lifestyles are so busy that we don't get to experience God's wonders. I don't know if you've seen this picture. Just if you bring that next picture. This is the most bizarre picture. Here's a guy sitting on his yacht on his cell phone, if you can't see it. And I wonder if any picture on his cell phone can be greater than witnessing God showing off right in front of him. Can you imagine being that close to a whale? You just have to say how great thou art. But he missed it. He missed that soul food because he was busy on his cell phone. I don't know what he was looking at, but nothing could have been greater than God breaching the whale in front of you. Psalm 23. He makes me to lie down next to the TV, next to the Netflix, next to the YouTube. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. These are the things 
that refreshed my soul. What God has created for us. God took David into his creation in order that his soul should be refreshed. This world is saturated with God's glory and his beauty that can refresh ourselves. But we're so busy with our eyes on all our other things and our devices. Think of this. Think of this. I just want to work with me now. Beauty does not have to exist for any other purpose than refreshing ourselves. Why do we have beauty out there? How did God create it like that? How come you can watch a sunset and your, your jaw can just drop open? But those amazing sunrises we get to, to see some. Why, why like that? Why are they so beautiful? God refreshing our souls. How come our eyes can see in this technicolor? We could survive with black and white, maybe a bit of gray. But God has allowed us to see in technicolor so he can do special things to our souls. How can we can taste so many different flavors and different foods? Many of you experience, you know, with COVID, you lost your sense of taste. I know some, some recently can't even drink tea or coffee anymore since, since the COVID days. But God has given us a sense of taste so that we can, we can just wonder at his creation. His creation. How about our ears? You know, it's just like a lot of monotone in there. Like somebody speaking through one of those, you know, if they've had a track or whatever, and like, oh, eh, oh, oh, oh. it could have been like that. But God has allowed us to hear this symphonic sound that we should be in awe. When you hear a piece of music, like when you, when you hear Puckerbell's Canon and D, that particular, that, uh, for, we all have our own piece of music, but that particular music, it brings tears to my eyes. Handles Messiah. Oh, we I don't we God allow, God inspired Handel to write this incredible piece of music brings tears to my eyes. Last year I took Diane to a rendition of Handel's Messiah. At, uh, it was up at uh, Marion Mill Monastery. The Tel Philharmonic. So we were sitting on, on the pews there, you know, it was uh, and I tell you what, it brought tears to Diane's eyes, both eyes. Eventually, just before uh, for the interval, she said, I can't take this out anymore. Get me out of here. Like, not her type of, of music. But Junior, it's incredible how God has... She, she's not into the classics. I want you to think about this. Why is sex so pleasurable? Not just functional. I mean, just could be God could have just called and organized functional, procreate, that's it. But why has God created it pleasurable? It's so that our souls could be full. God could have, you know, designed us just as procreation and there we go, but God designed sex within the bounds of marriage to be delightful. You just read the Song of Solomon in your Bibles and you see what I'm talking about. You know, there is a species of spider where after they have mated, the female spider eats the male spider. I think that would take the fun out of it, yeah. I'm sure some men would still go for it, you know, but anyway, maybe like a bucket list thing. But God has this world in which we live. It's not just has a utilitarian type of purpose, but he's created with all this wonder so that our souls can be filled. And folks, unless we change our lifestyles, we, we, we're going to miss this wonder that God has given us. And, and why is that? It's because all of creation is designed to fill ourselves and point us to the glory of God. Psalm 3 and verse 22. Praise the Lord every work in his dominion. Every work in his dominion. Praise the Lord my soul. What is your diet? What does it look like? What do you watch? What do you listen to that is feeding your soul? Does what you watch and what you listen to call you to break out in praise to the Lord. Can I suggest number two? We need to fill our lips with lips with thanksgiving and praise. You know, you can command 
your soul to give thanks and praise. You don't have to wait for your soul to be like that. Psalm 103 verses 1. Do you recognize this? Psalm 103 verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in with, within me, bless his holy name. Do you recognize the song? Can we sing it without... With just these words, bless the Lord and all oh my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord and all oh my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Incredible Psalm 46, verse 1 and 2. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Now, I know you're expecting me to sing this song, but, but I won't do it. But, but it's a great song, you know. I will praise the Lord as long as my life. Okay, I just lied. So here's what I know. You can praise, you cannot praise and complain at the same time. So if you found yourself in, in, this, in this death spiral and just waking up in the morning and always complaining and always grumbling, I'll tell you what, you need to wake up in the morning and just start praising. Find things to thank God for. It's so much better for your soul. You know what, you, you, you need to notice that, that there are a few more things that are more toxic to your soul than a spirit of entitlement. And what I mean here is when you go around and you whine and you grumble and you complain that life is not fair and life is hard and you deserve better than this and you deserve that and how come you're a victim in this situation. Folks, it's toxic to our souls. But when you cultivate an attitude of gratitude, you know what? You are, you are preventing the circumstances of this world from permeating and messing with your soul because if we can rise up amongst the quad mind which we live and say it is well with my soul and we can identify with Horatio Spafford say it is well with my soul first Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16 give thanks in all circumstances give thanks in all circumstances said Paul to the church in Thessalonica not give thanks for all circumstances but in the circumstances you can still give thanks you take time to care for your soul by praising God and giving thanks in the event not for the event I want to show you a little video but as Josh brings it up and before he plays it I want to tell you the story it's a father that father is holding his prem baby the baby is four months premature they've given uh, the parents 21% chance, I don't know how they get the one, but the doctor said about 21% chance that this baby will make it. And so he starts singing to his baby, and I want you to uh, see, he's singing songs of praise, and as he's praising God and looking at, at his newborn son, I want you to notice what his uh, little son does when, he st when the father starts singing hallelujah. It's hard to hear, we pull it off the neck. Let's, uh, let's play that, thank you Josh. the Lord. Okay, thank you, Josh. And as he's singing hallelujah, it's like the child is just uh, identifying with that moment. Folks, we need to learn to praise God in the moment, not always for it. Can I suggest today that we fill our minds with truth? Can I remind you that this morning we, we have a sworn enemy 
who's lying to us all the time. He's the father of lies. He wants us to believe lies about ourselves, our situation, and others. And many of us have bought into the lies hook, line, and sinker. You know, nobody starts the day intending to damage their soul. But what I know is that everyone with a damaged soul has bought into a lie of the devil, hook, line, and sinker. Let me give you an example of this, uh, this ship. So many of you are old enough to remember 1982. I remember very clearly the Falklands War. And uh, this is the HMS Sheffield. It's a battleship. It, it, it was, uh, it was uh, England, uh, Philip will correct me if I'm wrong, but, but Britain was fighting the Argentinians uh, over some islands called the Falklands. And uh, they were at war. And um, man, this ship was sunk. It was shipped by, uh, sunk by an Exocet missile, but it didn't have to be that way. The Exocet missile was identified by the officers on that ship as an Exocet missile and uh, belonging to France. I said, oh, France, they are our friends. But guess what happens? The Argentinians had bought it from the French and had been fired, and as an incoming, they had plenty of time to knock it out of the sky. I said, no, 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 this is, this is a, the, 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 can't be attended for us. It must be friendly fire. And uh, so this is our friends. Hit the ship, 20 lives were lost that day. Folks, we are being hit by the enemy's missiles. And we think it's friendly fire. He's lied to us about morals. He's lied to us about marriage. He's lied to us about finances. He's lied to us about what gives us pleasure. He's lied to us about how we do love. We've bought into that as being friendly fire. And we, we are sinking. And if you are worn out and you feel like your, your life is sinking, you need to ask yourself this question. Is what I have been thinking about really true? Is what I'm thinking about from the Lord? Or is it a missile from Satan? Psalm 19, the law of the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Psalm 119, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Lord, I know then it comes from you. The big, big lie, chasing the things of this world. We think they're going to fill our soul. I want to start closing off in conclusion. By telling you the story about Scotty Scheffler. Let me tell you about Scotty Scheffler. Scotty Scheffler was a, this guy is a professional golfer. Never won a major in his life. But US Masters last year. Scotty Scheffler woke up on the final day of the tournament and he was in the lead. And then by his own admission, he had a massive panic attack. Never won a thing. He doesn't know what it's like before. This is uncharted territory for Scotty Scheffler. He had to face this extraordinary pressure of winning probably the world's most prestigious golf tournament. He said he was able to gain his composure and remain his balance with a little help from his wife Meredith and his faith, faith in Jesus Christ. This is what he said. So for me, my identity isn't a golf course. Scheffler said, like Meredith told me this morning, if you win this golf tournament today, if you lose this golf tournament today by 10 shots, if you never win another golf tournament in your entire life, I'm still going to love you. You're still going to be the same person. And then she said to me, Jesus loves you. Nothing changes that. And then he said, so she shepherd said, all I'm going to do today is to give God the glory. That's why I'm here. And that's why I'm in this position. So for me, it's not, dash, it's not about a golf score. He said, my life is here to give God glory. That's why he's able to say, it is well with my soul. Folks, the last point of this morning, we need to fill our hearts with the gospel. The biggest lie of all is that God can't love me the way I am. You know, I've done too much, I've messed up too much, God can't love me. Every, need, every soul needs to hear that Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Every day, you can't preach the gospel to yourself enough. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, our penultimate scripture. What, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? Is God is for us. Who can be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? It is well 
with our souls. It is well with us. Write this verse across your souls. God is for us. He's not just neutral. God is for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you so much. He's willing to give his only son to die on the cross. That's why we take communion this morning to remind us God is for us. He gave his son to die for us. And we take those emblems, we are reminded, we, we are loved, we are bought with our price, with, 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 with a price. We're on our way to glory. We should say it is well with my soul. Our final passage of scripture, Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. And that is why Horatio Spafford was able to write, and I just want to read you his final verse that he penned, and then we will sing it together as we close. O oh Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds, they will be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall sound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, even so. It is well with my soul. When Jesus returns, may he be able to say, Oh, I see, I see. It is well with your soul. Please, let's stand together as we sing. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul it is well